Welcome, Nashik Mansfeld. It's very nice to uh, finally meet you. Uh, the Rubicon Pakistan uh, community is obviously very excited. They were so happy to have you. Um, and, you know, like I said before in our internal discussion as well, they were saying that, you know, oh, this is the guy uh, behind uh, the whole uh, Karafka framework. And, you know, obviously it's very nice to meet you. Um, for uh, let's just start with the uh, formal introduction. My name is Sabrina. Uh, I am the uh, community lead and digital marketing expert at Rubicon Pakistan. Uh, with me, I have Magic Mansfeld. For those of the uh, people who don't know him, he is the software architect at Castle IO in Poland. And he is obviously the author of uh, Karafka, which is basically a framework for to simplify Apache Kafka uh, based Ruby on Rails application development. So he has obviously he is definitely a huge uh, Ruby enthusiast and he has been working with Ruby and Ruby on Rails for over 15 years, which is obviously very impressive and we are very thankful uh, to have you so tell us about yourself magic how, how was you know your whole experience with Ruby. I'm super happy to to be here as well, so thank you for the invitation. Uh, well, as you said, I, I started with Ruby 15, 16 years ago. Yeah, 15 years ago. Uh, there were, those were interesting times because it was pre-Rails, pre 1.0, uh, completely different, uh, like IT, IT scene, com completely different setup of, of technologies. And uh, what, what made me Going to review was an accident. I mean, an accident, um, just a, a bit of luck. Uh, I was working with PHP at the moment. Uh, I was building an uh, internal content management system for the company that I worked at, at the moment. Uh, and then one of my friends just showed me Ruby. And uh, I noticed a huge difference in the F engineering effort I would have to take building the same things with Rails uh, and with pure PHP. And that was it. It clicked. There were many problems that we, we no longer have in both Ruby and Rails. Uh, luckily, uh, it was really problematic deploying applications, maintaining them. The, all of the things were different. There were no AWS, no Heroku, nothing like that. No, no automation. I would upload stuff with F FTP directly to the server and hope things would work. So, but it still was better than working with PHP at the time. PHP kind of kind of caught up on on things. But uh, fifteen years ago, Ruby was much more interesting. And uh, I guess uh, I could say that I never looked back. And uh, here I am. Right. Okay, so that's amazing. Uh, obviously, like I said, we are huge, huge fans and many of our live viewers are definitely huge fans of your work. They've been following you on GitHub, uh, like your open source projects and everything like that. So I think it's amazing to have you. Uh, other than that, uh, yes, so the topic that you chose was very interesting. Like uh, like I said, OSS supply chain security for Ruby on Rails, um, there wasn't that much, uh, traffic or not that much like knowledge about you know supply chain security so i do want to uh, and obviously I, I believe that our viewers do as well like what made you choose uh this topic for today's session uh so first of all because it's now a hot topic <laughs> so everyone wants to hear something about it or people want to know something about it uh with the recent research that some of the people did uh, the security researcher is on from that people that just hacked into Microsoft and other big companies using uh, rubygems.org and npm and and PyPy uh, that now became a hot topic. I didn't pick it. Uh, I mean, I got into open source supply chain before it was called open source supply chain security many 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 years ago. I build six, seven years ago, I built a platform for quality and security assessment of, of Ruby and Rails applications. I was hoping that it would, you know, get a bit of traction, get some users and uh, 
in the end make me some money. It didn't. Like majority of startups, uh, it failed. I, I think I focused too much on uh, the technical side uh, without validating the business. The, the whole concept was just too broad. Uh, but I, I kept it alive. I was invent, investing my free time into it to improve it for myself or things where I would use it. Uh, I would always take me with me to companies where I would work and to my other open source projects. So, mm, but at some point, I think one or two years ago, I noticed that uh, I could extract the security stuff out of it. I could focus more on that also because it was uh, an emerging market, something people didn't know about, something people didn't do, and that I could kind of reshape how you how you work with open source uh, supply chain. And here we are. So it was a long way to to get into this area of, of expertise. I don't know if I can call myself an expert in this, but uh, I have a I bit think of you knowledge, definitely so. can. I mean, your contributions to the community have been immense. I, I don't think you should shy away from calling yourself an expert, definitely. Uh, I'm happy people see it. So I'm, I'm really happy people do appreciate my, my security work around Ruby Gems. And I, I guess this is what, what makes, me, uh, makes me happy and motivates me. Right. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, Les, uh, I'm just going to let you have the screen for now. You know, you can start uh, with your presentation. I'm just going to be here. I'll just turn off my video so that uh, people can see better uh, when you share the screen. So, um, and also a, a lot of people are saying hi to you. So <laughs> you should say hi back probably. <laughs> right, amazing. So let's just start. Okay, I just want to make sure you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Awesome. Uh, I won't be able to see any questions, but if you if you write them down, uh, Sabrina can just read them for me. And I think this is the, this is the way we're going to go. Uh, so today's topic is going to be open source supply chain security for Ruby gems. Oh, a long name. Uh, but a really, really interesting topic. Uh, you'll be able to find this presentation. I, I think it's already online, so you can just open it uh, now or you can get back to it later if you're interested in the topic. Uh, I have a demo section, like every demo, it's probably not gonna work. Uh, <laughs> uh, so please be understanding if that happens. Uh, so, Today's session is just a tip of an iceberg. I do hope that we're going to talk about some of the most uh, interesting or most problematic things related to supply chain, including the recent Rails MEMA types situation that happened two days ago. Uh, and yeah, things that some of the things presented here are already integrated in RubyGems. So, yeah. Uh, a bit about me, Sabrina told you who I am. Uh, I spent most of my day-to-day -day work doing Ruby. And that, that, mean, that makes me really happy most of the time and sometimes really depressed. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I still wouldn't, wouldn't change the technology, uh, at least not from where I stand from. I'm a Krakow Ruby users group organizer. It's one of the biggest Ruby communities in Europe. Obviously, we do not have meetings at the moment, but we, we're kind of hoping to copycat what uh, uh, RubyConf is doing with having some meetings from time to time. I was also an organizer of a two-day long Ruby conference in Krakow called just KRK RB from Krakow RB. Mm. You can find me on GitHub, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, you can always mail me with questions. Uh, if you have something security related, you can always use my PGP keys that are on my website in the contact section. Uh, 
I do hope to give you a bit of knowledge on what are the risks of using open source supply, open source software, both the risks that were already exposed and some more theoretical ones. Uh, I'm going to briefly describe what is Ruby Gems for people that actually never thought what it is. Uh, what types of risks do we have and uh, what attacks are happening on, on Ruby gems and how we as a community can countermeasure some of them or majority of them. Uh, so Ruby gems is just a package manager for Ruby programming language. You build up gems and you should org and other people can use them. It is 13 years. Oh no, 20. 17 years old, it was created by Chad Fowler and Richard Kilmer. There are a lot of gems with a lot of downloads and a lot of users. And that's actually really important, but I'll get back to that. And, and currently Ruby is being shipped with Bundler. Bundler is the package manager for like package management library for working with RubyGems, whether they come from uh, rubygems.org or any other uh, sources. If you're in interested about some of the particular attacks in details and how you can do stuff to harm RubyGems users, uh, you can watch my 2019 talk from Ruby Kaigi. I did some live demos, I tried to exploit certain vulnerabilities of uh, open source supply chain. The problem with open source supply chain is that there are a lot of challenges and a lot of risks that you as a software developer, as an architect, as a security person need to, uh, need to deal with. Not all of them are related to packages or libraries being malicious. Some of them are more on the like, legal side of things, but they're not, it doesn't mean that they're less important. When using open source software, you need to understand that it might end up with outages, with uh, some bots mining cryptocurrencies on your servers or your computers, actually, uh, you might become a part of a botnet, you may lose data, you may, uh, your data may leak, and you might have some uh, pretty serious legal risks as well. And there are many ways to do harm with open source software. Uh, I'm going to give you some examples of it, but just to, just to mention a few of them. You can use typo squatting, uh, you can take over libraries or accounts. Uh, you can upload gems with something malicious without knowing about it. I do call it an accidental injection. It's actually a really funny thing, but I'll also get back to that. Uh, there's a risk of package tampering. Uh, there's a big risk of brand jacking. And obviously the, the not so new, but new kid on the block called dependency confusion. Mm. To start with the first one, typo squatting is just relying on people's mistakes when they use libraries with complicated names. Uh, I guess majority of the people that watch it speak English or understand English, but what you hear and how you write it is not always the same and you can just make typos. And when you do them, things might get really problematic. And sometimes they do. There are even gems that are uploaded with the type of squatting name just to prevent people from uh, getting something malicious, like, for example, Bundler, Rails, Ra Rails, and a couple others. But what is obviously, you cannot prevent all of that. Some names are going to be really similar. and. A really interesting example from a couple of months ago is a library called Da Meru Levenstein. I don't know how to pronounce it exactly. Uh, 
And what is really interesting about it is that there's a second library called Damaru Levenstein with the same uh, versioning schema and with the same code. And they are different only by an H in the Levenstein. Uh, none of them is malicious, just to be clear. And the author of the second one created it to compensate for some uh, depends dependency problems in the first one. But I've seen this pattern being used to build up more uh, more sophisticated gem base for attacks. Uh, it happened like a month ago for Datadoc uh, with the DD trace library. And when you, you might check the, the difference in the code, and as I said, for the model, Levenstein is just uh, unblocking uh, all the Ruby versions, but it do it does happen uh, for also for malicious reasons that gems are being built up. Uh, yeah, the problem with this is it can be automated. Mm. In theory, Ruby gems prevents uh, typo squaring with with a bit of uh, measurement of Levenstein distance. And uh, there are some patterns that you cannot use if you try to ship a new gem with a similar name to a popular one, you're going to be blocked. But first of all, it's not going to always work. And second of all, you can use something called brand jacking to bypass that uh, by doing some interesting stuff like Bitcoin Ruby versus Ruby Bitcoin. Uh, depending on an attack, sometimes you are interested in targeting, targeting a given company. Uh, you can go with dependency confusion with that. But if you're interested in a pure scale of things, uh, then a window of opportunities opens. It, it can be less sophisticated. And because there are so many downloads of things from RubyGems or NPM or PyPy, uh, the share volume of things makes it much easier to, to exploit. At the moment, I, I am running an experiment. I, I don't think I can talk about it yet, but long story short, I've been able to get into over 250 computers of people, including getting some root access of, into their machines, uh, just by exploiting certain patterns that big companies use and relying on them. I will expose that, uh, I guess, in a couple of weeks in an article. So sorry, I cannot do it now. It's not yet public. I still need to do some, some data analysis to, uh, to make it solid. There's also source type of scoring. Uh, Gavin Miller did a really good article on that in, in 2020. You can read about it. I did try to, to do something called bit scoring, which is relying on, on bits, sh bits shifting. Uh, and a CPU. I, I I did get some success, but I wasn't able to exploit it completely. It it, it was much more problematic than uh, source type of scoring. If you're interested in this type of of knowledge, uh, just read Kevin's amazing article. There are malicious takeovers, and they are really problematic. Uh, and they do happen for Ruby gems and other ecosystems. There is a new way of attacking, uh, of exploiting malicious take, like of doing takeovers that I cannot talk about as well at the moment because it isn't disclosed. Uh, it's going to be disclosed in a couple of weeks when we roll out a security system to uh, to handle this. But it, it, it is a big problem, and that that is something you need to be aware of uh, because you can have a really strict. Uh, set up of rules for your company that let's say a, a CTO needs to manually approve every single dependency in chat, right? And to other people in, in, in the company. Then you you partially make sure that you're not letting in any any new gems that would be just built for uh to, to be something malicious. But with malicious takeovers it's not gonna work that way because you probably already approved this library. Uh, it relies on social engineering. So there isn't an easy technical way uh, to mitigate this. There are some ways, but they're not always going to work. 
it's not that hard to be nice to people. Uh, and RubyGems provides you with a lot of knowledge that you can use to pinpoint uh, packages that you might be interested if you want to do something uh, fishy. There are many gems with many downloads. Uh, many of them aren't maintained. And you can automate uh, being someone. That is, you can automate uh, Rubocop fixes. You can detect many problems in those libraries. You can start uh, pushing simple patches. And then at some point, when you gain enough trust, the previous owner may just decide, OK, I was planning to abandon this library. I'll just transfer the ownership. And this is what, uh, what makes it really problematic, because you, you legally get the permission to um, and full access to the to the library. And it actually happened. It actually it, it happened with the event stream for NPM. Uh, the new owner was releasing some legit uh, updates and fixes. And at some point he released uh, Bitcoin mining uh, JavaScript code within the package. And it also happened for us as there is Ruby gems. It happened with Bootstrap SaaS. I think it happened with REST client in 2020, a couple other less um, popular libraries. Oh yeah, exactly. It happened with REST client. Mm. A different case, we'll get back to countermeasures in a second. A different case that is uh, really funny in my opinion is something I call accidental injection. So. It isn't a direct direct risk, or I, I didn't see it being exploitable from a Ruby gems uh, perspective, mainly because those attacks weren't designed to to get into Ruby gems. But it is funny because it's accidental. What that means is, uh, what I noticed when when analyzing data from different is someone uploaded a malicious code in a gem, but there was nothing uh, executing, executing it. There was nothing that would indicate that uh, this code was designed to uh, make any type of harm to RubyGems uh, users. So I reach out to this author and I ask him, hey, you know, you know that you have like a, like a Bitcoin expander here that's not being executed, but why would you do that? Uh, and the author was really surprised. He, he said that uh, it seems he had a virus on his computer that was affecting random files. And he didn't notice that one of the files in the gem that he, he built got, up, got affected by it and uploaded to RubyGems. So it was a purely accidental thing, but I, I still find it, mm, I still think it is a risk because you don't want to have gems that have uh, hidden powers, even if they are not going to do anything, I, I still wouldn't feel comfortable having a business running with uh, a Bitcoin expander on all of the machines, right? And in this case, I obviously tried to run it. Uh, it would try to access certain computers to download uh, Bitcoin mining software. The expanders are really nice because they are they do not contain the mining software. They are usually really small scripts that are supposed to just download the mining software. This is how they mm, this is how scripts like that try to bypass antivirus and like scanning systems. Uh, there is nothing malicious. There will be when they run, but. Uh, but yeah, there is always a possibility that RubyGems slash NPM slash PyPy slash whatever is going to be hacked. And uh, there are open issues in RubyGems for uh, tampering detection by checking the checksums and things like that. Uh, Bundler does not have this those capabilities yet. Yarn has them. Mm. What you need to remember is that what you've downloaded and once and what is going to be downloaded on your CI with Bundler can be something different. If there is someone that would gain access to RubyGems uh, admin system and S3 bucket and uh, you know the places where, where gems are being stored, 
content could be replaced. Uh, would it be detected? Probably not by you. Uh, there are some people doing uh, this type of detection. It is doable. Uh, but from an end bounder and user perspective, you wouldn't notice that. Uh, and a really big problem slash challenge with Ruby gems, uh, with gems in general, with uh, Node.js packages, with Python packages, is that there is a post install hook, which means that just running bundle is enough to grant all of the access to your computer to each of the gems creators uh, for unlimited amount of time because you can fork the process, you can uh, infect other files, you can do whatever you want uh, within the permission scope of the user that is running the bundle install command. And that is really bad with, mm, with Maven. Installment of packages is just downloading them. So there is no post execution, anything until you start using packages. They do not pose any risks. With RubyGems, they do. Downloading with Panther means installing, means giving away all of the permissions. And, uh, and that is just bad. Uh, and that this isn't a theoretical problem. It is, it, it is being used a lot. Uh, with uh, Bitcoin Ruby or Ruby Bitcoin, one of them with a couple other previous attacks with some of the attacks that were never disclosed publicly that were detected. It is being used because it's, uh, it's super easy. You make a mistake by using a library and that's, that's all. And you lost your SSH keys, you lost your uh, AWS credentials, you lost your data, your software, whatever you have on your computer uh, that can be read and set up, sent over the network. If you did it, that's, that's all. And as I said, 250 computers uh, got something I, I, I designed uh, that way. Obviously I didn't design anything malicious and I'm not sending myself any Public, like private data and just making sure that my well-designed packages reached certain places. Uh, RubyGems is getting better with security. So they implemented the two-factor authentication to tackle, uh, to tackle some of the problems, but it's, it's adoption is going slowly. And uh, I think it's gonna take years to, to get where I would like us to be. Uh, luckily for us, there are countermeasures that we can uh, take to make sure that in majority of the cases, we're safe. Don't use open source. Simple as that. Some companies actually build a lot of stuff by themselves to make sure that, uh, that they can have software that they will always be able to maintain. Uh, I don't know if it's the best approach. It's, it's hard to me to, to uh, give a judgment without understanding a, a particular business. For some cases, it may be valid. For others, it may be not. Uh, it's like with Yoshitaka Sakurada, the Minister of Cyber, Cyber Defense of Japan, that confessed that he does not use computers. Well, it's a really good approach. If you don't use computers, you're not going to be hacked. Simple as that. Uh, but there is no general solution. And I don't think there's gonna be. Ruby is really dynamic by its nature. You can do a lot of things in many ways. Uh, and yeah, and it's just, I, I feel it's more about getting really good practices and uh, understanding of the problem and then mitigating the most uh, important risks. Use only verified sources. That's obvious. Problematic with dependency confusion, but uh, I, I think we're gonna talk about it a bit later. Mm. Watch out for typos quotings. They are still being used. 
whether it's uh, just typo scoring relying on typos or brand jacking, which is reverting some something, let's say uh, if Bitcoin review will be Bitcoin, uh, Kafka review will be Kafka, um, DD trace slash DD tracer of, of Datadog um, and things like that. You, you need to be really fond about what you're downloading. Uh, attackers that I've seen in 2021, exactly with, with Datadog, attacker attackers, uh, yeah. Copy pasted their source code, copy pasted their like GitHub star references and all of those things. So if, if you would open the particular gem website on Ruby gems, you could get confused. Uh, because it looked like Datadog account. Uh, the name was similar. There were hundreds of stars. The versioning matched up, but it wasn't a Datadog's profile. And you need to be like, really cautious when including new gems, both when you write the definitions and when you do the assessment. Mm. You need to review licenses. And uh, funny enough, I think you all know the Mima type situation that happened a couple of days ago. Uh, the, the author of this gem didn't review or didn't apply proper licensing schema. So at some point he had to yank previous versions, making rails uh, and like breaking rails and breaking uh, deployment for many people that do not um, like harvest and aggregate their own artifacts for uh, building up things. And you might end up with legal, just legal problems using open source you shouldn't be using. Uh, open source does not always mean free software. And that's something you, re you, you need to keep in mind. Do not stick with gems that are not being maintained. That's a general advice. And if you really rely on something that is not being maintained, take it. Uh, fork it or maybe take it over from the previous maintainers just do something about them mm. never use new gems in general if a gem is younger than let's say one month just don't use it simple as that connect critical cv notifications with any type of pager duty on call system you have uh, only critical ones and only for your production setup. I mean, you don't want to be woken up in the middle of the night because uh, RSpec has some problem, right? You don't run RSpec on production, so you could tackle that in the morning. But there there might be some, some security problems, uh, and there probably will be, and there were, that need immediate uh, attention from someone from the security team or engineering team. Mm. Never install gems without checking them. I know that sounds crazy, uh, but that is my general advice. Come up with a bumping policy for updating gems. You can either stop bumping at all, but then uh, you're going to have a really big problem in a couple, couple of years when industry moves on and you, you stay with outdated libraries for outdated databases and, uh, and stuff like that without like, uh, bug fixes and so on. But you can come up with a with a bumping policy and do not just remove gem file lock and update and just uh, try to update gems one by one. But keep in mind that it is also not the best thing ever. You're not supposed to download slash install things you're not supposed to run bundler without knowing what is getting to your computer you need to have a setup if, if you use some dependence auto dependency management tools uh, that make pull requests keep in mind that you need to have a really good ci setup with isolated steps Otherwise, if there's a malicious version of a gem that gets out of bumped because this is how those tools work, uh, there is a risk that in, inside of your environment variables, there are, uh, for example, Docker keys to um, ECR, right? Which means that uh, someone can take those keys 
and alter the last image that you would be pushing there. Uh, you basically need to have really good isolation or you need to have really good rules for automatic bumping. Uh, tools like this for people that don't know, basically update dependencies, create a pull request, the pull request gets picked up, uh, the CI picks it up and runs specs, uh, tests, all of it. But at the same time, it gives an executable access to anything that was there. And uh, as far as I know, those tools do not check for like internal things. They rely on version dependencies. They build up a dependency graph. They resolve to uh, they resolve the internal dependency and then just create pull requests. Uh, really useful, but risky. Uh, yeah, build decent isolation in between CI steps. Mm. Always review stuff before installing. Uh, and what is really important and you need, and what you really need to keep in mind is that what you see on GitHub and what you see on RubyGems may not be the same and quite often isn't. Either the builds, the, the gem builds contain some artifacts, some uh, files that are not on GitHub or the other way around. You never know. I can release uh, Kafka 2.0 that is completely different in terms of code into RubyGems uh, and pointed to a GitHub branch or, or commit and reviewing it on GitHub gives me uh, less knowledge or no knowledge about the, the gem that reviewing it directly from uh, RubyGems package sources. There is a button on every single gem page that can help you with this. If you open it, it's going to show you the, the actual difference. I'll, obviously, as long as you trust me, uh, in between versions of given gems. And this is one of the things that, that is built into different IO, the platform that I built. This platform is, is meant to, I built it for myself and it, it was designed to tackle problems that I was facing and it is free at the moment. Uh, and different works in two ways. So first of all, it analyzes packages and helps me pinpoint problems. I then open issues on GitHub. I try to improve the ecosystem of both from security and uh, quality perspective to make it easier for regular people. Mm. You can just ask for the diff of in between package versions. You're going to get it, you can review it. And then as long as you trust me, you you will see what is going to be downloaded as long as the package wasn't tampered uh, later on. But Defend looks for this as well. You can easily install it and play with it. I have a demo and I'm just going to show you how it works. I encourage you to play with it, test it out and go with it or do things manually the way you, you find it suitable. I try to keep track of uh, both the risks and the quality of packages and open. I try to open as many issues as I can about things that shouldn't be in uh, RubyGems releases based on the content and, and things like that. I track risk for packages. Mm -hmm. And I am working towards improving the ecosystem. Uh, so different, as I said, not only focuses on quality, but not only focuses on security, but also focuses on quality. Uh, and sometimes you would be surprised, but people accidentally upload 500 megabytes of development logs with their gems and then people download that and wonder why it is taking so long to bundle. And you can help. Mm. If you install Defend, Defend might ask you to review some of the things from time to time. It does not always mean those are malicious things or potentially malicious. Uh, it's a bit randomized and it's a bit more complex, but Defend might ask you to check stuff. And 
if you do it, you can mark things as safe and pro or problematic. And I use those signals uh, for a bit of internal scoring. And uh, as a, every crowd, crowd founded system, the more people check stuff, the easier it is for security people to focus on things that are might be potentially problematic. We're working on building a more complex sandbox for analyzing system behaviors with new gem releases. Um, it might take a while, but uh, had my own success, a bit of success. I, I don't want to disclose how things work, but we're getting better and better with behavior tracking analysis. And in summary, trust no one, not even me. Uh, Update, thing, update things when you know they're legit, uh, track changes, uh, be aware of the whole development cycle that you have, uh, starting with, with developers that try out new libraries till the production uh, delivery. Have isolated stages in CI, uh, build up a security flow that won't be a burden for your organization and that will match the, mm, the security level uh, in regards to data you're working with, try a different. Uh, and as always, educate yourself. Mm, this would be the end, but I have a demo. Uh, but maybe we have some questions. Yes. So we actually do have a couple of questions. Uh, so from Ali Ibrahim, uh, so for one, uh, like, you know, when you were talking about uh, the licenses, the licenses portion mm -hmm. of the presentation. So he is asking that most of the gems are under creative common licenses, which licenses would you usually recommend so that they don't uh, run into any kind of issues later on? Mm -hmm. uh, that depends on your business. So uh, keep in mind that the I'm not a lawyer. It's not a legal advice. Okay, that that that's the first thing. Uh, there is no one answer because uh, you would have to talk with a lawyer, and it is supposed to be handled on a per case basis. But my approach is that the G GPL is the most risky because if you use and 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 compile GPL components all of your software is supposed to be GPL. Lesser GPL is less of, less problematic because uh, I think Sidekick is on an, on an LGPL license because you can use the software, uh, but only if you adapt it or patch it, all of those things have to become LGPL, lesser GPL. Uh, things that are usually safe for MIT, uh, yeah, LGPL, Apache license, Ruby license, all of those, normal ones that do not affect the rest of the ecosystem. But what is really what is really problematic and what I, I think we're gonna solve uh, at some point, we, that is me and, and Defend and some other people helping out, is the problem where someone, the, the problem that happened with MEMA types, right? Someone took something with a different license without all of the license awareness, we used it on a different license, it became a dependency, and then it had to be fixed. And uh, this might be a big problem. If let's say one of your developers copy pastes one file from a GPL open source software, and instead of including the, the GPL code, this GPL license code goes directly into your software. This is a, a different problem I will was not talking about, but from legal perspective, that is a problem. So to sum up uh, answer to this question, there is no one answer. Uh, GPL is the most problematic, but uh, as the MEMA types example showed, you never, you, you can never be fully safe. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's actually all. Right. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Magic, for answering that. We do have another question uh, from Ali Ibrahim. He is asking, can Defend, IO, or similar be integrated within the CI workflow on GitHub? Yes. If you go to Defend IO slash docs, there is a command bundle secure. But what you need to keep in mind uh, is that it's too late. 
basically. Uh, integrating stuff into the CI is what that means is that this potentially malicious or illegal code already went through the developer's computer, maybe a couple developers, and then got into the CI. And what that means, uh, keeping in mind how Ruby gems are built, is that a computer already got compromised, right? Because someone had to install the package, uh, build it locally, let's say test it, uh, and upload uh, a pull request into the CI. So that is too late. I'm not saying it, it does not provide any value. It provides a lot of value running things uh, periodically, making sure things are, are OK, and so on. But I do feel we, we should start from the developer's computers. And that's why I built Defend, because Defend uh, integrates uh, seamlessly with, uh, with Bundler using Bundler plugins. So whenever you're working with gems and you run Bundle install with a new gem or with an update, uh, Defend make sure that uh, whatever is being downloaded complies with the company policies from the moment a uh, developer wants to use stuff. And if they really need to test something out, they always can give an approval on the UI, but then we can at least track what happened, to whom, and what was the scale of, uh, of potential uh, problem. Right. Okay. That is very interesting. So, uh, like you said, you did mention uh, about, you know, uh, gem security and everything about like, uh, for example, if a gem is uploaded on GitHub and, you know, talking about the GitHub stars mm -hmm. and everything. So we do have a question. Uh, does the number of stars contributors on GitHub or Ruby gems total downloads a good criteria to decide whether to use some gem or not? Mm. <laughs> That really depends how you do the assessment. Uh, I, I think you can still see my screen, so let's uh, let's do the let's do Karavka. Uh, those two numbers, right? You're interested in this and in that. Uh, you could say that the number of stars is a decent indicator of people being interested in a library. The problem with this is you can upload any library pointing to any other repository. So if I could just replace Karavka, Karavka uh, in the gem definition with, uh, I guess, Rails, Rails. And you would think I have 48,000 stars. There is no indicator unless you hover over it and you see the, the, the link description that it is, that it belongs to the same organization. And this is one of the ways people uh, malicious actors fake stuff. Uh, they point to the name, the original gem reference, number of stars. So if you click here, or if you click uh, on the home page or source code, sometimes there's a source code sec section. Uh, you think you're going into the right, uh, oh, here, the right place. But it's not always like that. So unless you make sure that there is direct reference and correlation in between a given gem on Ruby gems, stars and the source, and it and that it is it all belongs to the same entity, uh, that's not a good factor. Total downloads, well, it is a good indicator of, of a gem popularity, but I've seen this uh, being exploited by building up downloads. You can easily, let's say, fake 100,000 downloads. And then, you know, you have uh, 500 something stars pointing out to someone else as stars and a different repository. You have 100,000 downloads and you think something is okay. But then surprise, surprise, it may not be. And it doesn't handle ATOs. So, uh, so if it, if it's, one of the things, I would call it like a gem popularity in general, it, it could be used as one of the factors in a gem assessment. When, when and if you actually verify the, the origins of those. Uh, thank you. So we do have another question from Hamad Sufyan. 
uh, he is asking, is it not the responsibility to ha handle gem-based bugs handled by Ruby community? I think it depends. I mean, whoever is the contributor, like you said, it, the, the contributor could be, you know, a fake one. So how do they actually uh, cater to um, having a bug-free gem? Mm. So I, I guess there is no one answer, right? I'm a contributor to many open source projects because I open issues. Sometimes I uh, submit fixes. I, now I mostly open issues or, or like be marks to, uh, based on the gems releases. I, I would say that it's no one's responsibility to do anything because that's, this is open source. You cannot expect anyone to do a free job for you in any way, right? It, it's always nice when people contribute to things, but uh, there is no legal obligation or any type of uh, moral ob obligation for anyone to do anything with open source. And uh, and if someone, <laughs> looking from an open source maintainer perspective, I'm always happy with, when people help me, when they open issues and when they create pull requests. But I always make sure that whatever they uh, are submitting complies with my quality and security expectations. And I think this is the way you're supposed to do to go if you're a maintainer. But I know some people just click merge and they make new releases. So there's no one answer to your to your question. Right. Uh, thank you for answering that. I do agree with you. I think with open source. It does get tricky because obviously there is literally like no authority who, who is like keeping, you know, a check of, you know, if this is bug free or virus free or anything like that. So I think it does bec uh, become very problematic and especially for uh, Ruby professionals who are working uh, for like an organization and, you know, they are working on a project that is on enterprise level, I think it becomes even more problematic to use like open source um gems libraries repositories because like you said you know things can go wrong and you know you shouldn't really be trusting unless that you know they are contributors that you know about and you know you know about the library and i think the most important part that you mentioned is if it is being maintained that's i think that's the key takeaway into deciding whether because i think with, with ruby and rails all of the features that you know you do want to implement they can be found in a gem and it's convenient and i think that is why it's one of the reasons why it's so popular but at the same time you really do need to uh, look at the implications of using an open source gem and if you again if you are working for an enterprise skilled project uh, you have to be very um, careful so I do agree with you 100% with that. I mean, th there is a way if you're, if your company's multi-million dollar business is relying on someone's free time, uh, well, just give them some money. That's simple as that. For sure. Uh, there is either, either crowdfunding or you can just approach certain maintainers, right? Mm -hmm. If your business, if the complexity of your business, uh, is in terms of relying on open source is so big that without someone's open source, you wouldn't be able to sustain your business. Then you're in a really tight spot, which means that for uh, open source, that is a single owner or a single contributor um, own only, you, you have two ways to handle that. You can either craft a commercial or semi-commercial deal with them, yeah. uh, which gives you a bit of stability, or you can invest your engineering resources to understand this open source as long as it's uh, you know under a license with which you could fork it and so on. You can you can under invest in someone in your team understanding the core principles with, behind this open source, and in case it would be uh, dropped or it would go not in the, the direction you need it, just fork it. Absolutely. So we do have another question from uh, Chandan Jod. He is asking, uh, what's your experience enforcing information security policies and GDPR related checks in development workflows? <sighs> That's tough. 
the stuff. Uh, every any policy that uh, is a manual one is not gonna work. People because people are clumsy. I am clumsy. I forget about stuff. I make typos. I rush things, and un unless I have a tool that that forces me to do certain things, I'm probably not gonna do them because I'm just lazy. I'm lazy by nature. Uh, that, I, I think that's that's why I'm a programmer. I'm always looking. You know, uh, why do things for five minutes when you can waste two days trying to automate it? Uh, I think that auto, having out, automatic tools, and that's why I built different, different uh, with, with this bundle plugin. So you don't have to remember about this. You just drop it in in a gem file and it just works. And this is my approach towards engineering in general. If I have to do something and if I have to remember about it, I want to automate that and make, make it into some sort of a automatic rule or a policy. Mm. And I don't like word enforcing because enforcing indicates that people do not agree with uh, with something, right? They're being forced to do something. I would prefer educating people, making them aware of potential risks, risks, agreeing with them that we need to follow those policies, uh, not because we need a checkbox uh, with SOC2 compliance, for example, but because the business depends on it. And if the business goes down because of a legal or, or uh, legal issues or you know uh, the business being compromised, for example, we are all going to end up without work. So that, that's just a mix of people understanding things, agreeing with them, and then making sure they don't have to remember about it uh, anymore. <laughs> yeah, that does definitely make sense. Like you said, uh, I think it was in one of, your, uh, one of the slides in your presentation, make your efforts effortless. So automation is definitely the way to go and obviously yeah. i mean there is always a possibility of human error like no matter how careful or how much scrutiny you put in into your project or whatever it is it, there is still a chance for human error right so we have i mean so, yes please just to adapt to this uh Automation, it might not always be enough. Like, like, mm. Let's take the dependency confusion case, right? Mm. Uh, if you have a dependency confusion case, let, let's say you mirror all of your gems, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, a case like with mimic type yanking wouldn't affect you because you end up with, a, let's say, a gem in a box or a gymnasium, you have a mirror, which means that whenever you uh, request a gem from your private server, it's going to get back to uh, Ruby gems yeah. and it's going to fetch it and it's going to cache it. So uh, Mima types young wouldn't affect you. But the problem with this and a couple other things mm -hmm. is that it exposes you to different types of threats. So there's always a trade off uh, mm -hmm. with and, and a balance mm -hmm. whether you would like to be a bit more, uh, let me rephrase, whether you, you agree to. Uh, being more exposed to certain problems over mm -hmm. others or being exposed to others, you know, and in regards to something else, you just need to assess it per your own organization. And mm. uh, if you're thinking about something like that, you can always drop me an email and I can always uh, give you one or two advices in the context of, of the business you're running. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, right. So we do have another question from Sofian. He is asking, sometimes uh, I want to single gem like device and verify, but a couple of more gems automatically install because they're interlinked with devices. Then what to do? Dependency hell. Hmm. <laughs> uh, again, uh, there is a problem of open source mm -hmm. that is really hard to, to fix. Yeah. Gem may depend on 20 other gems, and those mm -hmm. gems may depend on other gems. Yeah. Uh, you can always use different to check the gem you're using. If you mm -hmm. see a new version of it, the, the probability that the whole chain of dependencies is going to be updated at the same time is rather low. You can check it. Uh, if, if you go to different and there's a gem spec update, it might have uh, uh, a dependencies redefinition 
And to add up with, to that, you're probably not aware of it, but you can have transient dependencies that are hidden, which right. means, let me share my screen, that a gem can depend on other gems, but they won't be listed here. So if, if you go into a gem gem spec, uh, where is the download? Mm. Okay, let's do it from Karaf, uh, from Karafka repository. Uh, I know you're not supposed to review it from from Ruby Gems, uh, from GitHub, but just for the sake of, of argument, here you can define all your, all, all of your uh, dependencies of your gem, right? But uh, <laughs> there is a way to define dependencies and install them in a way that they won't be uh, mm -hmm. visible when you do an inspection. So if you open a gem spec you might think, oh, great, this gem does not have any dependencies. Uh, when you go to RubyGems page and you open the, the, the gem website and you see runtime, runtime dependencies, and it indicates zero. It doesn't mean it is like that. So yeah. um, I am tracking gems like this uh, because it is a, a indication of, uh, I wouldn't say um, them being malicious or them potentially being malicious, but it is an indication of a non-standard behavior. Most of the time, you want to have the, the dependencies being listed in the gem spec. There are some reasons why people don't do that uh, for really sp specialistic, specific cases. Mm -hmm. But for the sake of argument, uh, dependency inspection also should be made based on the code changes rather than on relying what people say is yeah. within within the gems because you need to remember that uh, what you see on rubygems.org is mostly built from metadata and metadata is mostly built from the declarations you see in the gem spec and that can be that that can be altered that can be updated change it can change in between versions and it may not reflect the gems behavior uh, based on the code base hmm. right. Uh, so let's just take some more questions. Uh, I know we are on a bit of a time crunch. Uh, so, no rush, no rush. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we have another question from uh, Chandan. He is asking, any recommendations comparing and contrasting the benefits and shortcoming of security tools? For example, Defend versus SNYK for Ruby. Mm, I don't know this tool. So it's hard for me to say. Uh, what I can tell you, though, is mm -hmm. that uh, the gems that were found uh, that were malicious yep. this year and last year, oh, all of the cases came from Defend. So Defend was first to detect stuff like that. I'm not saying it, it's going to detect all of the things. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that there are no malicious uh, gems in the uh, gem ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But what I can say to you is that Based on my knowledge of other tools, um, Defend is the earliest in the supply chain uh, because when you hit bundle install, Defend mm -hmm. already runs its, its security policies while other tools that are either um, source, uh, like source dependent because you, you build up your intermediate source for mirroring and stuff have other problems or some tools run on the CI or based on uh, Git push. But yeah. as, as I explained, downloading a gem with Bundler is more than enough. So unless you stop it there, there is someone that is going to be compromised. Obviously, the overall scope of uh, the compromise and, and the scale of, of it will de depend on whether it happened on production or on a developer's machine whose machine was that, what was there, and so on. Nonetheless, it, still, it might still mean that someone got compromised. So, yeah. Right, perfect. Uh, let's just add, uh, sorry, let's just uh, answer another question that is also from Ali. He is asking, GitHub these days provides a list of vulnerabilities on your repo on any of libraries you are using. Wouldn't this solve most of the needs for a normal app unless you have a very sensitive use case? And also many thanks for answering all the questions. Mm, so CVEs are for libraries that aren't designed to be malicious. 
that's a bit of a gray area where if you find a malicious gem and you try to report the CVE, the, the CVE reporting will probably be rejected uh, because right. CVEs mean uh, like vulnerabilities of, 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 of different name of many types, but for non-malicious by design libraries. So first of all, uh, you take out of the picture um, this gray area of gems that were designed to be malicious or to be designed as research gems that you might end up with uh, for many reasons. Uh, the next case is dependency confusion. Uh, with this type of attack, uh, you don't, your your gem is potentially being fetched from Ruby gems, but it was not supposed to be because it was supposed to be a private gem. Mm -hmm. the, those issues won't be in CVEs as well, right? Uh, so that's the second thing you're kind of missing on uh, with with Ruby gem CVEs. Uh, GitHub has a, a really good CVE database, but it's not composed of all of the vulnerabilities, and it's not. Uh, assessing any legal threats. So it's only for security things that were publicly disclosed and, and announced. Uh, and it's not handling cases like MEMA types. So let, let's look on MEMA types example. It wasn't a security vulnerability, yet what it caused to a huge amount of Rails applications was basically a, a complete deployment blockage. Unless you build your artifacts before and you have them cached, whether in a Docker container or some sort of an intermediate layer, because this gem is no longer on Ruby gems, your deployment is blocked. You need to deploy a, a quick fix and it's not going to happen because the gem is no longer there, right? It isn't a legal case. It's not going to have a CD. Yeah. Uh, but if I were in a situation like that and I was, uh, I would prefer to get this knowledge as early as I can, which is, hey, uh, depend the dependency you're relying on in your production system is no longer on Ruby gems. You won't be able to use it, uh, so you probably need to take some action. So, uh, will it handle all of the cases? That depends. If you have a really strict bumping policy and you bump, let's say, once a month, uh, mm -hmm. only mm, to versions that are old enough uh, to potentially get CDs and to uh, be discovered and you don't use any you let's say you use only rails in, in your applications uh that should be enough mm -hmm. uh but if like like sabrina like you said in with with rails and ruby there's probably gem for everything yeah and people complain on that that ruby is no longer that in, innovative uh ecosystem of you know uh new gems popping up but the reason for it is all of those things we usually need are already discovered. Yeah. Uh, we don't have to rediscover them over and over again. Uh, so if you rely only on things like that, you should be fine with CVEs, but you can, you're you still prone to human errors. So I, I had a case like this in Japan, uh, I, I think two, two or three years ago, uh, someone noticed I'm, I'm using Ubuntu on, on my uh, laptop. And this uh -huh. guy came to me and he, he said, hey, you know, I have this gem that is uh, uh, doing something with the UI that it makes it feel like some sort of a feature of, of uh, Mac OS. Right. I don't remember what, what was it. Uh, just install it and you'll see how, how useful it is, you know? And I just started typing gem install and then I thought to myself, okay, yeah, wait, wait a second. What if he's actually just running a security assessment on people mm -hmm. and checking if they will install this gem just because he would ask. And I saw him doing this the same with other people. And it, it is kind of natural. You want your gem to be popular. You want to get some users. Uh, Ruby conference is a really good place to, to make it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but people would just do it. And a single mistake and, and, and you're done. So CVEs, yeah, that's nice. Uh, but what is also not the best, in my opinion, with, mm -hmm. uh, with GitHub CVE tracking is that it lacks context. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said during my presentation, context awareness is really important uh, because if there's a CVE in R spec, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I, I know that's important. I know that's really bad. 
But if there's a, a critical CVE that is exploitable in your Puma server that is running mm -hmm. on production, that is something you need to take care of ASAP, yeah. right? So with GitHub notifications, as, as far as I know, I, I'm, I'm receiving them as well. They will just ping you that this library is, is vulnerable, but without the loc location assessment, production staging, uh, test environment, whatever, it's, 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 it lacks the context. Hmm. Right. So th that's actually very interesting. And at the same time, again, like I said, it, it just, it's very tricky with open source and, you know, you just have to keep, uh, uh, like you mentioned earlier as well, you really need to check the code before installing it on your system. So again, uh, very crucial points. Uh, let's see if we have any other questions. Uh, other than that, obviously we do want to give a huge shout out to um, Sufyan, Ali and Chandan for their you know, very uh, insightful questions. I'm sure that you know, uh, other viewers did definitely get a lot of idea with you know, open source security and you know, gems and everything and how you're supposed to go about it. Even if you are uh, you know, in a, like, uh, like, like you said that you know, if, even if you do want to use gems, use them the right way and make sure that they are very stable and secure. Because again, it depends on what type of project. Maybe you have a project that entails something that's very you know, sensitive data. So you definitely don't want to risk anything. I mean, if you have a job, you don't want to risk your job. So <laughs> have to be very careful. Uh, right, uh, I don't think we have any more questions. So let's just wrap up the uh, session. Uh, again, uh, Magic, it was very nice to have you and you know taking out the time. And obviously it was very informative, very insightful. I'm sure uh, to have you again in another one of our episodes, but thank you so much for taking out the time. Thank you as always, uh, have a great day, stay safe. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, you can always mail me. I'm always happy to help uh, fellow open source uh, users and contributors. For sure, for sure. Well, thank you. And let's just say bye bye to the uh, audience. Uh, thank you, everyone who joined into our live stream. I hope you guys have a good weekend. Uh, bye bye. Bye. <laughs>